My name is Mike Schooling. I run a company based in Worcestershire called Indra. Uh, we deal with um, electric vehicles of all sorts. Um, we started off doing conversions um, and uh, we've moved into more recently working with Nissan Leaf, um, mainly Leaf, uh, also the Outlander slightly. Um, all good with that. Um, I'm the direct, well, one of the directors there and also a technical lead. Um, what we're going to talk about today is working with newer vehicles, uh, the issues surrounding that, uh, a lot of the uh, bureaucracy and paperwork surrounding that, um, and why they're more difficult to convert than the older vehicles. Um, so what I'm going to go through is, um, I'll leave that on there, um, what is the easiest EV conversion, and then work out why a newer conversion would be different to that. So what we're going to look at is you look at an old vehicle, there's little electrics on there, um, you don't, obviously don't want to be restoring the vehicle as part of conversion, but working with a good old vehicle, um, <laughs> you want it to be simple, um, you want fewer electrical systems, and ideally as much space as possible to fit your batteries in, because uh, that's your biggest component to get in there. Um, the electrical system bit is really key, because um, you'll find out as you start chopping and changing things just how many different systems there are to interface to. Um, so an ideal conversion is something like an MGB, uh, something from the 60s or 70s. No electrical systems, simple, carburetor driven, uh, no ECUs on there to worry about, something along those sort of lines. The other sort of thing we see a lot of is things like Defenders and various Land Rovers and things, so that, that fills the space aspect of it. So if someone said to me, what's your ideal EV conversion, I'd say something like this. Loads of space, fit everything in there, it, perfect, it's, you, you know, the weight uh, distribution you can play about with because you've got so much space to play about with. Um, so why are uh, newer vehicles harder to work on? Um, we're going to go through this stage by stage, cover a couple of topics, and then we'll keep some questions to the end. So number one, um, newer vehicles use a monocoque sh uh, chassis um, where the body cannot be removed from the, uh, the, the chassis separately. Um, so they use a subframe design, uh, and one of the issues with that is it constricts space. They use it uh, because it's easier to manufacture. Um, you end up tight clearances, things are tighter together, uh, things are bonded rather than screwed together. It's less space, less access, it's a nightmare to work on. You can still do it, and it's a lot more efficient. You get sort of lighter structures, things like that. Um, you can get much better handling, more rigidity in the chassis, but those are your issues with that. Um, so there's looking at a um, <coughs> Defender 110 chassis. Uh, with the body removed and you can see you could quite easily just pop a battery pack somewhere like here um, you could put your motors in there. I mean you've got so much space to work with with a modern car you have not got that and um, look at this this is a subframe design car this is a, a Camaro <laughs> I don't know why we chose a Camaro but it shows it really well how you've got your whole body uh, attached uh, but you haven't got an independent chassis that just bolts on the front with your engine on it I mean that is much harder to, to work with um, this is the key one, uh, crash safety improvements. So in older vehicles, there's no crumple zones generally. Um, and as a result of having all these crumple zones in the modern cars, you're reducing the space for your EV components. So you can't put your battery pack right up to the very extent of the front bumper. You can't do the same with the rear. It's a nightmare. <laughs> we'll go into that later on. Well, I've got a bit of stuff on some legislation and some, uh, some details from DVLA saying what we, uh, they think is going to be the rules for this, they haven't got a process for registering an EV as yet. They're, they've spoken to us about what we think we should put in there, but we'll, we'll go into that later. Um, so showing modern car again, section here, crumple zone. Section at the back, crumple zone. Tech, the passenger cabin in the middle. Older vehicle, this is all solid. I mean, look at an old Land Rover or something. It's just solid bar straight to the front. <laughs> not, not safe at all, but it does mean you can hang battery there. Um, the other issue is more electrical systems and so much more complicated, so many more parts to link into, more to go wrong. It's be all and all. If you're looking at an electrical dash system, suddenly you take the engine out and all your gauges stop working. Uh, your power steering stops working, your ABS system stops working, traction control, absolutely all of it just stops. Older vehicle, you haven't got any of that, so why worry about it? <laughs> um, so this is a, I believe, Chevy Volt, uh, sorry, uh, Vauxhall Ampera in the UK. Um, showing the extent of the electrical systems, all the different wiring harnesses, where they go, it's just surrounding the whole car. You go back to something like the MGB at the start and you've got a couple of wires to start your engine and that's it. <laughs> Maybe headlights. <coughs> uh, computers and microcontrollers. So we look at, again, Chevy Volt, Vauxhall Ampera, 100 microcontrollers, over a million lines of code in there. 
if you start chopping and changing a car like that, it's gonna, <laughs> you've got to go through every one of those lines of code, make sure it still works, make sure it's still safe. It's not gonna happen. And the MGB showing it, no microcontrollers, no code. Why make life hard for yourself? Go for a classic. CAN bus. Uh, a few of you uh, watch a few online TV shows will have heard a lot about this. Um, so CAN bus is uh, a standard used for communicating between different microcontrollers on a car. Uh, so the idea being you have different components set out around the car and they can communicate with each other. For example, you'd have your ECU, which you may brain the computer, talking to your power steering system, your dash, your various other pieces of car. Um, ABS has been the other key one in there, and also traction control these days. Um, and what it allows is basically two-wire communication, can actually have one wire as well, but we won't go into that. Um, two-wire communication between two different microcontrollers on the car. Again, back to your MGB or your Defender, none of that. Uh, just to show here, this is the, again, back to the um, Fox Lampera, uh, showing all the different uh, CAN bus systems on the car. So you see main EV ECU here, you've got brake system, uh, air conditioning, uh, servo system for stuff, uh, electric power steering coming off various other bits. The idea being all these devices plug into the same physical cable and talk to each other across that. So for example, your power steering to work, it needs to know the vehicle speed, which picks up from wheel sensors, it needs to know the engine speed, picks up from the engine. Absolute nightmare. Again, back to the old car, don't need any of that. Uh, also, just showing the process here, these slides will be made available for anyone that wants them. The process here at the bottom, just on how, what systems go through from plugging the vehicle in to, to driving it. Um, the dash in, uh, integration, this is key. I, I love seeing this in modern conversions uh, that haven't been done very well. Um, older car, you've got a flat dash generally. It's got a few cutouts in it. A bit nasty, but functional. Newer vehicles, you end up with a nice curved dash, sweeping. I mean, you can't reach your windscreens that far away. Um, no standard cutouts. All your gauges are built to measure. So what I've got here, again, MGB dash. And it's just simple. Two and a half inch gauges, four inch gauge. They're standard size. I can go and buy one of those off the shelf uh, Halfords. Uh, I can make one myself and these cutouts you pull it out, it looks fine when you get back to it. It's you know, all your switches, I can cut a hole out in that dash, no one would really know if I put an extra rocker switch in there. No one would know if I put a double size stereo in there. You could just cut and change as much as you like. With a newer car, so uh, we've got the MGB little two-seater sports car, modern two-seater sports car, we've gone for a Mazda MX-5. You look at that, there's no circular parts, there's no nothing you could chop and change. You couldn't go and put a rocker switch up here, it'd look crap. So, <laughs> it's just showing you can't work for these newer cars as easily, and the older cars are much easier to make it look as it should be there. We're just going to go into the instrument cluster shown here now, and just show how these are made these days. So that's just one box with some digital gauges in. Um, these are actually um, motors uh, inside, which cause those to turn, uh, whereas on an old mechanical speedo, for example, you'd have a cable which it's connected to a front wheel somewhere that would then turn and or gearbox perhaps. Um, this is all electrical, uh, it's driven by CAN bus, uh, so you've got some communications going on there in binary form. Trying to interface with that is impossible. Uh, you need a working vehicle to run a capture on, to capture all those messages and then generate them yourself. <laughs> right, uh, again. So you just use a mechanical old gauge that you can work with easily. We're going to go into now, so that, there's sort of some technical stuff and there's some boring paperwork stuff, but this is really important if anyone's going to do a modern vehicle. It's hard enough with an older car. Uh, so this is your big get out, is type approval, um, which is basically a system used by car manufacturers where they approve a, a chassis or a shell um, rather than approving the whole car. So if I go and buy back to the Mazda MX-5 there, I could buy one of those, the whole car has been approved. Whereas if I go and buy a Ford Transit, it's just the chassis of that's been approved. I can put whatever body I like on it, that's still approved. So if you go for a vehicle that's got type approval, a newer vehicle, you can then play about with it a lot more without affecting the way it's been crash tested and the way it's been played with. Um, just showing transit here, the different types. Uh, it's mainly commercial vehicles you'll find with the type approval, simply because there's so many different layouts they use on them. Um, some passenger vehicles, for example, the Citroen Berlingo um, is type approved uh, for use as a passenger car or a van, for example. So a few vehicles like that you will find have this type approval and that's your big get out to play with it. IVA, so if you don't go and convert a vehicle, what Valley have now said, which hasn't been the case in the past, all conversions from petrol to electric will have to go for an IVA. That's what they're telling us now. 
um, which is where it should be, in my opinion. Make sure it's road legal and suitable. Before, you would just have to MOT the car, which is, <laughs> it just <laughs> isn't good enough. Uh, no one's going to look at to check your weld is, is good enough to hold in that 300 kilo battery pack, which is just scary. Um, so thankfully, they're finally doing this. Um, it's normally required on kit cars um, and heavily modified cars, which, of course, an EV is very heavily modified. And it's basically a very in-depth MOT. You think MOD, uh, MOT on um, steroids is the way I think of it. They check absolutely everything on the car. What sort of cost is that? Um, depends. <laughs> um, if the EU get their way, we will also be doing something else called EMC testing, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, and that will be very expensive. Do you get a plug-in car grant for these conversions? Get what, sorry? Plug-in car grant? No, no, no plug-in car grant for conversions. What we'll do is run through questions at the end. I'm sure there's loads. Um, crash safety, and um, this is some of the work we've been doing with the DVLA on what we think should be in there uh, for conversions, because um, we're starting to see more and more of them. So informally, I'm probably not supposed to share this, but I will. Um, <laughs> and no components can be mounted past this stair wording, uh, past the last member before a crash member. So at the front of the car, you'll have a crash bar, normally made out of aluminium or some sort of alloy. And behind that, you'll have another uh, a steel member, a structural member, and you can't mount anything between the, well, in front of that last member. Um, so uh, I've seen conversion where people hang battery boxes off of crash bars, and it's just... <laughs> It's not good. It actually crumples in. That's what slows you down when you have a crash. It's not what's there to, to mount components off and hang 300 kilos worth of batteries off. It's not a good thing. Um, so no components in the crumple zones at all. Um, how you designate a crumple zone, I don't know. But I, most vehicles, fairly obvious because there's a big gap there. Or, or maybe something that will crumple like a radiator or something like that. Uh, they must have an inertia switch. Um, for those of you who don't know, an inertia switch uh, is a... Uh, is a a switch which will uh, break when there's um, a high shock applied to it, a uh, high G-force. That's the idea being if you're in a crash, it will suddenly a bang, and that will kill the, uh, the car. Um, you also need a kill switch in a vehicle, um, a big red switch for a conversion. Again, ugly. How do you get that into your dash? Uh, batteries need to be secured. Um, it's exactly the same battery requirement as the uh, MOT requirement for a lead-acid battery in a standard car. Um, so they need to be strapped down. If the vehicle's tipped upside down, for example, are they going to short on the lid of a battery box, for example? Uh, and the other thing they've really stipulated is orange cabling must be used for anything over 48 volts. Um, to be really clear, uh, what they have said is it's actually 60 volts, but the fully charged voltage of a 48 volt battery pack nominal is much higher than 48 volts. So they've said anything above 48 volts nominal is now orange cabling. And I'll go into cabling in a sec, because that's a really important thing. Again, we see it a lot when we work on conversions and people have used uh, audio cable off a, a car amplifier for an audio system. It's just, I've seen speaker cable used to uh, join a DC-DC converter to a traction battery pack, which is just hideous. Um, this is the massive one. This is what's really going to catch people out, and this is a key point to take in. Um, EU legislation. Uh, ABS fitted to all vehicles, even bikes now, uh, made in the EU since 2007. If it's fitted, it has to work. Uh, if it's fitted, it has to work. Fitted from new. Um, traction control, as of 2011, if it's fitted, it has to work. And again, for bikes from 2015 as well, I think it's about March, no, sorry, June this year, they're going to start doing that. So. If you're working on a car new in 2007 for ABS, 2011 for traction control, it must work. Traction control is incredibly difficult to get to work because it takes in various parameters from the engine, uh, whereas ABS is simply looking at the vehicle speed, uh, which you've still, you've still got a speed pickup in your wheel for the vehicle speed. Um, it's not looking at uh, any of the, the drivetrain parameters. So that's easy to get working. That will generally just work when you do a conversion, whereas the traction control side of it is a lot of work to get working. In fact, I'm not aware of anyone as a hobbyist that is capable of doing that, being blunt. Um, I'm not aware of any companies that would even consider doing it for a one-off vehicle. So I don't think we're going to see many conversions on vehicles newer than 2011, simply because of that requirement. Um, this is a European problem, uh, but again, if the EU get their way, this could become a UK problem. So there's something called EMI testing, um, which is required by a lot of the European countries now, uh, also known as EMC. Basically, it's a, a check for whether it's to look at whether your vehicle will cause any interference whatsoever with anything else. Um, it's the FCC run it in the US as well. It's a similar sort of requirement. Not UK requirement yet. That's really important to stipulate. It will be. It'll happen eventually. Um, and 
uh, it's worth mentioning that a company in the Netherlands have built a uh, well, they've modified a, a US made motor controller uh, along with a Bulgarian com company called Kostov who make a motor um, which can be used in conversions in the UK and that's got a certification to be used uh, and it meets these requirements. To show you the sort of testing this has, this is an electric sweet, uh, street sweeper uh, being tested at the Mira facility in, I think it's in Gaydon, uh, just in north of Warwickshire. Um, it's basically a room with loads of pointy things, and they point aerials at it, see if they could pick up any interference while it's running. Um, it's bloody expensive. <laughs> We've looked into it for a few things, and it's just not worthwhile. Um, again, you don't want to be involved in this, but if you're converting a vehicle, um, and this will be all vehicles, not just from a certain age, uh, you will have to go through this requirement at some point, and that will happen in the UK, I almost guarantee it. In Europe, they already have to do this. It's a few thousand pounds to put a car through. So then they add that to the cost of your gift conversion. It's not great. Um, I'll get out some of this. Orange cabling used. Uh, the reason they use this stuff is so you can see uh, that it is carrying something other than 12 volts, uh, basically a high voltage system, uh, cabling through there, uh, sorry, current through there, voltage even. <laughs> the idea being, you can see it, uh, no one's going to go tap into this to go wire in a car amplifier or um, there, was, there was an event where someone ended up in hospital uh, in a Prius because they decided to tap their car audio amplifier into one of these cables. Um, very loud for a few seconds, as I heard. Um, <laughs> um, the cabling itself, I'll pass this round after, it should be double insulated. Uh, and we've also heard unofficially, this again is from DVLA, that it needs to be zinc coated as well to stop oxidisation, stop the cabling degrading over time. Like I say, I've seen some horror stories where you see the really thin, horrible stuff being used and it's, it's not going not gonna to be functional. Um, the other thing with this stuff is the emergency services are trained to look for it. So if you put your car on its roof in a ditch and they find you, they need you to use the jaws of life to cut through the car. They're trained to look for this, so they won't cut through it. So the last thing you want is for you to get out of the car and kill a fireman or something if they're trying to save you. Oh, it's, it's. Um, what we are allowed to do is add black, white or red heat shrink or tape to the end of these to designate what polarity is. White is used for mid-pack, I should mention. So if you're not on the most positive side of your battery pack or the most negative side, you can use white to designate it's somewhere in the middle. Um, our advice is to use orange cabling on everything regardless of the voltage, uh, unless it's a 12 volt system. Uh, so if you've got a 36 volt scooter or a golf cart for example, use orange cabling because it designates that that is different from the, the 12 volt system on the car. Uh, again, you see red and black cabling uh, similar to this. Again, it's double insulated, but how do you know it's 12 volts or high voltage? So our advice is to do that. What I'll do is pop those together with the conduit, which I'll go into in a sec, um, to be passed around. Um, CE mark components, so this is the conformity your rope uh, requirement. Um, not a UK requirement as yet, <laughs> is a requirement in the EU, it'll probably come over to the UK very soon. Um, best practice in the UK I'd say is to use CE mark components. Um, it's basically a, a measure of quality, it's met a minimum standard. Um, what we find is a lot of Chinese and US made battery chargers, anything with a MOSFET or an IGBT in it seems to be very low quality if it's built cheaply. Um, the EU built stuff seems pretty good, um, but US and Chinese stuff, careful unless it's got a CE mark or a, a UK kite mark. Um, again, best practice, just go for it anyway. If you see a battery charger which is half the price without that mark, there's probably a reason for it and it'll probably end up burning your house down. Any questions? 